this morning, I'll just bring you a brief exhortation, just as a witness and a prophetic decree into the foundation of this union. The Bible said that the walls were framed by the word of God so that the things which are were not made of the things that do appear. The only true foundation in this realm is the word of God. Every other thing is a lie. Time will prove it so. And so it's a heaven and earth will pass away but not one jot or tittle of my word will pass. And so whenever we embark on an adventure, an enterprise or a journey, it's always important that the basis of our convictions and confidence is rooted on the eternal word of the living God. And this is why this morning, this charge and this exhortation will be brought to you, not just to instruct you, but also to form the bedrock and the foundation of your union. And I believe that on the strength of the witness of this word, this marriage will be preserved. It will become the foundation, the unshakable foundation upon which this covenant will try. And so these words will enter your spirit. I know there's a possibility of you not hearing everything that is said. Others will not understand. When you marry, you will know. So those of you who are not yet married, will leave that for you as a puzzle. On the day of your wedding, maybe you will hear 10% of what he said. Because uh, it's a long journey getting here. It's a long journey. And from here, it's also a great journey. And so his mind is contemplating a lot of things. But we believe that these words will enter your spirit. He said, while men slept, the enemy sowed his seeds. So spiritual utterances sometimes, even if you don't understand it, it enters your spirit. It will germinate. And so we are persuaded that it will germinate. So in case you don't hear we will still bring it and fire it from every cylinder because it's a witness to your foundation. Praise the Lord. I just want to share this morning on the purpose of marriage. Because many times when we engage on a reality or on a journey, it's possible for us to be carried away by the many attendant possibilities that come with that reality and forget the true essence of that reality. As you embark on this journey, a lot of things will happen at the frequency of your emotions. But the truth is that your emotions are here just to add flavor to this union. The essence of this union is deeper than your emotion. If you prosecute this union on the strength of your emotions, you will discover you will not maximize the most of this union. As you embark on this journey, there are lots of things you will attempt to do that will be a function of the counsels that you have received from your fathers and your ancestors. But marriage is older than your great-grandfathers. All they know are the things they picked up and the things that the spirit of the ancestry introduced to them. They are not sure foundations for marriage. In as much as we pick the healthy counsels they give that is consistent with the laws of morality, we understand that the spiritual essence of marriage is deeper than the things that their traditions gather together. And so you will go past your emotions, you will go past the counsel of your village, because it's possible, I know where you came from, my place is close to you. And so they can tell you certain things, like men don't say sorry. They pick that from Obadibu. Is not as deep as the ancient wisdom that gathered married together. They may tell you that where we, where we come from, men don't wash plate. And when you wash plate, it's a sign that you are weak. I can tell you it is the wisdom that crystallized from the pride of the Edoma man that originated that wisdom, the other counsel. It's not rooted in the scribes, the scrolls of marriage. And so you need to find out what God had in mind when he put this union together and established this institution. The first institution that God established when he began the project of man was marriage. And so marriage is the oldest institution in the chronicles of God for humankind. And on the strength of that, before a man can succeed in life, in ministry, or in any enterprise, his marriage must work. If your marriage does not work, you will fail. 
no matter how anointed you are no matter how charismatic you are no matter how gifted you are because according to the counsel of the divine the foundation upon which a, su a successful man will stand is on the union that he establishes and that was why before God began to entrust things to Adam before God left the garden for Adam he created a helper for him he said God created all things when he looked around he saw that the man would be insufficient in himself so he brought him into an institution he brought him into a union that would be the bedrock and the deciding factor of a successful sojourn on the face of the earth and so we have to go back to understand the precepts of God that forms the cardinal pillars of this institution called marriage and I want to share some things with you this morning that may not sound very heavy in your ears but as you begin to journey you understand in the name of the Lord Jesus I just captured five purposes of marriage this morning because of our time and I will not be digging so deep into it because we don't really have time this morning but I trust that the Holy Ghost will bring a witness into your spirit that will be deeper than everything that we utter the first purpose and foundation of marriage in the archive of God was to introduce man into a mystery the idea behind marriage is to create a system of oneness because when you study God and the realm of God you will discover that what makes God powerful and forever king and ruler over the whole creation is because of a mystery that exists in God and that mystery is also the foundation of the Christian faith is what we call the mystery of the Trinity what we call the mystery of the Godhead that it is possible for three entities to exist as one coexisting like that equal in all rights even though they are different but they are one eternally it is a mystery that cannot be understood the reason why God is powerful and God is God is not just because he can create it's actually because there is something that creation can never unravel as a puzzle that creation can never understand that three entities can be one and completely one in all ramification and so when God instituted marriage he wanted to introduce that same mystery that exists in the Godhead in the context of human existence now that mystery does not exist in the angelic realm God did not give angels permission to walk in that order and it's one of the reasons why man is higher than the angels in divine ranking the Bible said angels don't marry neither are they given in marriage because what God wanted to achieve in marriage is a possibility that two different beings can become one so one that you can't find any difference in them and so when that kind of union begins to exist there is a power that it generates that's why I said a house that is divided against itself cannot stand what it goes to mean is that any house that is one no force can break it because the true power of the immortal God is in their unity that cannot be separated if you study Genesis chapter 11 the Bible said when they began to build the tower of Babel God looked at it from heaven and God said something he said these people have become one and nothing they desire to do can be stopped so the only way God could address that issue was to divide them so what that goes to tell us is that everywhere you find a corporate union that oneness exists the immortal power of God dwells there so even God himself was terrified when he saw that it was possible for a whole world to unite as one he said let's look upon these guys closely this thing that they have begun to do because they are one even we cannot stop them the only thing we can do is to divide them so if your union can model the mystery of oneness even if the whole of hell is unleashed it has no power against it because the greatest power in the universe is in oneness that's why the bible said in matthew chapter 18 from verse 16 to 18 it said wherever two or three are gathered together there is a force that they generate that cannot be uttered so when two of you come together you are actually mobilizing the immortal powers of god he said one will chase a thousand but he said two they will not chase two thousand because when that union is activated everything that happens is geometric he said they will put ten thousand to flight why one is pursuing a thousand when they become two you would expect that they will pursue two thousand he said they will not pursue them ten thousand will look at them and run 
because the power they begin to generate is beyond arithmetic progression is geometric is an ever increasing power so you will discover that maybe before now there was a favor you were looking for in ministry that you prayed in tongues for one year you didn't have but suddenly because you have become one the propensity of the power of god that is emanated from your spirit becomes geometric and even though you are not praying as you used to pray you will discover that favor will just begin to flow you won't know what has happened it's a mystery because in marriage there is a geometric power that is activated it's something that exists in God that he didn't allow the angels to experience. When God created the church, he didn't give us individual anointings. The church, the power of the church does not anchor on individual anointing. The power of the church anchors on corporate anointing. God knows that a Peter will rise, a Paul will rise that will be powerful, but he didn't bank on it. He knew there will be apostles, there will be prophets, there will be pastors, there will be teachers. But he said the power of the church is not in the apostolic office. It's not in the prophetic office. It's in their union. Because every time creation can become one, there is something that comes out of that union that no force can stop. It's called the mystery of oneness. Today, the Lord is teaching you that it's possible for you to become one. And the only way you can become one is to let go of your individual identity. Because before you came here, you may be shocked that maybe sometimes in the evening, you want to be alone. You have lost that right. You see, every time I'm alone in the evening, the Holy Ghost speaks to me. That's where the power of my ministry is. You have lost that right. But the advantage is that that thing you lost will not be a disadvantage. Because the moment she compliments you, there is something you can never generate that will be produced. Because it is in that mystery of oneness that bad things take place. That's why no matter how powerful you are, you can't produce a child. No matter how intelligent you are, you can't produce a child. If you like, begin to fast down for the next 10 years. A child won't come out of you and say, All God said, have bettered me. It's not possible. But the moment both of you become one, even if you were not praying, a child will come out. Because in oneness, even in your weakness, power is generated. It's a mystery in the realm of the divine. That's why you can, you can, you can be having fun and procreating. You can be praying and procreating. Everything about you begins to tower to the heavens. It's a dimension of God, but it is in oneness. So the price you pay in order to enjoy that power is that you will give up the things that form your individual identity. That is what we call Bethel in the Bible. The house of God. That mystery. Two can become one. Three can become one. When God called Abraham out in Genesis chapter 12, there was a place Abraham visited. It's called Ai. Ai is a pile of blocks. If you have 10,000 blocks here, it won't profit us. No matter how powerful you are, if you are individualistic, you can't profit God. This building we are sitting in is no longer a pile of block. There is something that has happened. A force has galvanized the blocks together. And the moment the blocks can come together, the blocks begin to have value. It becomes a house. We can now sit inside. If these blocks were scattered together, all of us would have been under the sun. If these blocks were scattered, all of us would have been disoriented. The reason we can sit together in a coordinated fashion is because these blocks lose their individual identity. You can't find the one that is red. You can't find the one that is white. No matter how you look, you cannot find which one is different. So the more the blocks lose their identity, the more the house is built. The power of the house is in the fact that you are willing to let go of your individual identity. If these blocks were trying to say no, they must see me. Because me, I am silver. The others are red. You can't have a house. That will become a cancerous growth. In this union, everything you try to make your own will be a cancer. And you know, cancer is part of you. But it is you growing irregularly. It is you growing out of proportion. It is you growing out of hand. You can't be helped. If you want to see the kind of power that you have never experienced before, the law and the mystery of oneness demands that you let go of your individual identity. Everything about you that affects this union will have to be sacrificed. But when you sacrifice it, there is something in God that you will discover will come out of you that you can never bet by faith. You know, when Jesus was in Gethsemane, in Matthew chapter 26, that was when he had the greatest threat on the Trinity. For the first time, he said, my spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Jesus had the choice at that time to turn away and leave the Trinity. But he knew that 
the kind of power that is generated in the Trinity is not in the fact that the Father is powerful. It's not in the fact that the Holy Ghost is powerful. It's not in the fact that the Son is powerful. The power of the Trinity is in their oneness. So even though he didn't want to, in fact, Jesus confessed with his mouth. He said, Father, if it were possible, let this cup pass me by. He said, it's not my will, but thine. Do you know what Jesus said? What it meant was that it was not Jesus' will for you to be saved. Because when he considered the pain that we go through, he couldn't bear it. But when he considered the Trinity, there is something about that oneness that he cannot forego. So even though he didn't want to, he gave himself up to be killed. A day will come when things will challenge this union. It will anchor your pride. It will fight your pride. You will say, no, I have kept and preserved my pride for 10 years. I have never knelt down for anybody. I have never begged anybody. But when you consider the union like Jesus Christ, even though it is not your will, because of the corporate operation that takes place in this union, you will give up your pride. And you will be weeping, but you will say sorry. You will be dying, but you will say sorry. And you know how painful it is in marriage. Sometimes when you say sorry, you will assume that she will say, wow, he said sorry and hug you. When you say sorry, that is when she will now realize that ah, she is your queen. She has been long. She heard a man say sorry. So she will want you to say it four times. And then you are like, are you all right? Is it because I knelt down? Are you okay? No, sir. Even if it's not your will, but because of the union, you will die. Because it will take death for oneness to be achieved. I know you are an apostle. And very soon you have crusade in stadiums. And when you are coming, people, they will carry four black jeep. As you step out, people will kneel down. And be... She is not one of them. I know you will soon raise daughters. So many daughters. That they will, Papa, Papa, Papa. When, when you say, hey, everybody will. This one, when you say, hey, if you say, what, do you, what, what are you saying? And when you, you, you are like, you are used to everybody kneeling down. If you want oneness, you will hold your peace. And then later in the evening, you will call her and say, this is what I meant. And then you will remind her that she is supposed to call you Lord. If you want to fight, you are breaking your home. And any house divided against itself, the verdict has already been passed. It will not stand. I know many times you expected that when you were dating, every evening he called you and his voice was like honey. You know this kind of talk that when you are talking, even the person who is five meters away won't hear the voice. You know sometimes when people are in love and they are talking, you are wondering, how is the other person hearing? Because you are lying on the bed with your friend and then your friend is, hey, how are you doing? I missed you. And then you are hearing, what is he saying? How is the other person hearing? The voice is as fluid as honey. You will not hear those honey voice again. Now you will go home one day and you will come back and say, why is food not ready? What are you doing? You would expect that you should know that both of you went out and you are all tired. If you talk back, you will divide the house. The power of your union is in your oneness. Because what God wanted to model through marriage is to show that the same way God is one and God is all powerful, both of you will become one and you will demonstrate the power of God against the powers of darkness. It is in that oneness that your children will be preserved. Your children will not just be preserved because you are an, an apostle. And then you will come and say, the Lord keep you. Everywhere you go, you shall be preserved. No. If your house is divided, when you finish making your prophetic decree, the devil will still have a way into the union. He will find it. If you want to sustain the same kind of power that exists in the realm of God, then you must learn to become one. It will take a lot of price, but you will pay it. This has nothing to do with who is right or who is wrong. If you want to function on the strength of who is right or who is wrong, I assure you, your marriage will break. Because in this equation, they don't solve problems by who is right or who is wrong. They actually solve problems because the journey is great. And so when you look at what is in the future, even though he's wrong and he doesn't realize it, you will leave it. You will, there's something Jesus said. He said, suffer it to be so for now. If you see that she is wrong and she doesn't understand it, you will suffer it to be so for now. The idea is because you will watch and guard your oneness like it is your life. That is one of the things that sustain the Trinity. And that is what will sustain your marriage. So that at the end, when God looks at his relationship with the Holy Spirit and with the Son, your marriage will mirror it. That is the same relationship that exists between Jesus and the church. And that was why Paul called marriage a great mystery. It is a mystery that cannot be understood. 
the same way God existed for aeons and they have always been one he said that is how your marriage should be and he said your marriage is a reflection of the relationship between Jesus and his church in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 30 he said marriage is a great mystery he said but I speak of Christ and of his church so every time you say your wife have no value your wife is a wicked woman go back and check the portrait because the pattern is not your father and your mother so don't make the mistake of saying my mother never spoke back at my father and I'm not saying your wife will but I'm telling you that the pattern is not your father and your mother don't say my father always provided we never beg for food the pattern is not your father the pattern is Christ and the church so every time your wife is not learning and your wife misbehave go and check the way the church relates with Jesus Christ and then you will discover that every time God say don't do a that's all we know how to do so the same way God was patient Jesus is patient with the church you will now take that body to be patient with your wife everything your wife doesn't understand becomes your job to teach her because even you God told you many things that you failed instead of killing you he comes back in the Holy Spirit and he begins to teach you he sends a man of God to tell you that's what you will do for your wife because the pattern is Christ and his church there are many things that you will discover she doesn't do the same way Jesus relates with the church that's how you relate with her so you want to find out whether your marriage is working or not it's not the days you are laughing or the days you are quarreling the reason you will find out whether your marriage is working or not is that your marriage will become more and more like the relationship between Christ and the church it's a mystery it is oneness you will come to that point where you will lose the ability to, to hit her you will come to that point where you will lose the ability to keep malice with her you will come to that point where you will lose the ability to fight you can endure everything that Jesus can endure for the church and then she will come to that point where she will lose the ability to dishonor you because the way the church always honors Jesus hope you know that sometimes a loved one die you are very angry but you know you can't be angry with God you now say it pains us so much but we give glory to God are you really giving glory to God you go for a job interview they pursue you you say God is where is where no you trusted God you were hoping that it will work it didn't work instead of you to come back and say Jesus what you say to what you will look up because of honor and reverence you will still thank God that's how you relate with her with him because that's the mystery the pattern is that he is the Christ you are the church and so every time you relate with him you will relate with him the same way the church relates with Christ and every time he relates with you he will relate with you the same way Christ relates with the church if both of you can work on that frequency after a while you will become so one that you will begin to look alike and men will look at you and say what is happening the power of that mystery will begin to rub off even in your natural body it will begin to rub off and men will look at you you will think like your wife your wife will think like you you will function like your wife your wife will function like you and people will be wondering which one is orgasm which one is is Wallonia? the difference has been cancelled out because oneness has been achieved when that happens even the devil will know that any day he wants to come to your house it's the wrong address because you have become one he said because these people are one nothing can be withheld from them every prayer you pray will be answered I'm telling you nothing can be withheld from them there are many things you are trusting God for now that you can't have or that you have not had watch six months after your marriage you'll be shocked when they say he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord it's not just because whether the woman is good or not good it's about the mystery that governs it because you have become one even if the woman is not good as it were there is something that union can provoke it's a power and that power have no regard for limitation nothing can stop it today you are stepping into a mystery a mystery that will ensure the preservation of your future can i assure you that same power will make causes irrelevant in your life i'm telling you there may be causes that are in your bloodline if you harness this power that i'm telling you about those causes will break on their own accord because you have become a mystical union the same way that men can understand you the same way spirits cannot understand what happens between the father the son and the spirit that's how they will not be able to understand you they will say things will happen to you it will not happen even when you are not praying about it 
So the more you are one with your wife, the more you are releasing that power and it will become a radar around your life. The moment I got married, I entered into a warfare. The biggest warfare of my life, but I can assure you that I didn't notice. If I was alone, it would have broken me. I know this thing by experience. There is something that will happen to you, but your focus is to ensure that you don't allow any space. That's why in Ephesians 4.27, he says, giving no place to the devil. When you keep malice with this woman, you are not keeping malice with her. You are opening the door for attack. Because your, your, your relationship now is a mystery. When you oppress this woman, you are not oppressing her. You are causing the, you are giving room to the devil to destroy you. When she dishonors you, she's not dishonoring you. She's opening a door for attack. She may come back later and say, I'm sorry. It's beyond I'm sorry. Because she has already opened a door. A spirit has entered. You will fight later to cast that spirit out. You will labor later because the insurance system of this union is the mystery of oneness. The same way the father, the son, and the spirit are one. That's how you and your wife will become one. Not because they don't disagree. Because in Gethsemane, we saw that they had different opinions. Oneness is not that all the time you will, be, you will agree. It's not that all the time you will be on the same page. Jesus was on a different page with the Father in Gethsemane. He said, this is not my will, but let thy will be done. Many times, I assure you, both of you will be on different page. But because you know that your power is in oneness, you will put aside your differences. Your wife will offend you. She will be unreasonable about it. You will come and hug her. While you are hugging her, you are dying. I assure you. But you know that there is something you want to preserve. Your wife will be offended by what you have done. She will want to tell you, you will claim you are the man of the house. Shut up! When I say shut up, you shut up. You don't talk when I'm talking. If she understands that oneness is more important, she will leave you for a season. She won't stand up and say, me too, I know how to talk. If you say you know how to talk, you are not wise. Because by the time you insist and talk, a demon will join that conversation. And when that demon joins that conversation, even after you settle, the demon will not go. Because if there is one thing I know is that demons don't have bodies. And so they are looking for places to occupy. And if you make your home one, they will stay there. And the problem with demons is that when they have occupied the place, when you chase them, they will come back. Because there is scarcity of vacuum in the spirit. They don't have space. They will always look for a place. So you will not make your family a ground of enlightenment. You will always fight it out by oneness. Never allow anything coming between the two of you. Not your friend, not your mother, not your father. Nobody is permitted to come here because you have become one. The angels worship God, but their worship of God stops in the throne room. They don't exceed to where God is one. That one is a prerogative of only the divine. That's the same way you and your wife, your union, is a prerogative of both of you. If you can secure oneness, nothing can bring your marriage down. Even if the whole world rises against you, even if the whole Hades rises against you, nothing can bring you down. In that oneness, all the power you require is released upon you. The second thing that oneness does is that it causes you to walk under open heaven. In Psalm 133 from verse 1 to 3, it says, Behold, how beautiful and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in harmony. He said, It's like the dew upon Mount Hermon. He said, Dear, the Lord commands his blessings. If you want your home to become a headquarter of blessing, you don't need to be telling God every day, Please bless us. Just love your wife. And you will be shocked. Let your wife just honor you. You will be amazed what will happen. He said, There, the Lord commanded his blessing. Why? Because it is a beautiful thing when brethren dwell together in harmony. It provokes the visitation of God. God is looking for where people are one. Jesus was praying in John 17. He said that they may be one even as we are one. And he said when you are one, I and my father will come and tabernacle with you. There is something that provokes the release of heaven. There is something that provokes an open heaven perpetually. It's when two can become one. This thing I tell you is a mystery that has never been understood in the spirit realm. That's why marriage is a great mystery. You will pay the price to become one. And if you become one, indeed, you will see the glory of marriage that you cannot tell another man. See, 
if you are enjoying your home and another person is enjoying his home, he can't explain it to you. You don't have enough words to communicate it. It's a sacred thing. You will just be happy. It is the way you look and the way you are promoted that will show it. Suddenly you become married, more doors open to you. More honor comes to you. you are, people are wondering what is going on. You that they were seen at one small level before, all of a sudden they can't. It's marriage. It will change everything about you. But you have to pay the price to be one. The reason why God instituted marriage is so that men will learn the mystery of oneness. That is what exists between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is on the strength of that adventure that you will forgive your wife a million times. Not because she deserves forgiveness all the time, but you are pursuing something. It's an assignment that is committed to you. It's on the strength of that adventure that your wife will forgive you a million times. The advice of the world system will be that we have come to a level less divorce. Nothing is solved by divorce. Divorce just introduces you and compounds your problem. It introduces you to another crisis and compounds your problem. The journey is oneness. So even if you hit a ground where the world counsels divorce, you know that when you began, the chart that God gave you is that both of you should be one. So that even on the last day, you will present her a perfect bride. It's an assignment that is eternal and you will keep it. Number two, purpose of marriage is to cause you to become conformed to the image of the son. In Romans chapter 8 verse 29, the Bible taught us that what God had in mind concerning man was for man to be conformed to the image of the son. God is not pleased that you are preaching. And I'm using this example because you are a preacher. God is not pleased that you started a ministry. That is very good. It advances the kingdom. But God is particularly interested in you first. And that is why even if you were not an apostle, God would have saved you. So God didn't save you so that you become a preacher. The goal is for you to become like him. Because when he created man in Genesis 1, 28, 26, he said, let us make man in our own image. But man is a fallen man. Man has taken the identity of another spirit. In John 8, 44, he said, you are of your father, the devil. The lost of your father, shall ye do. So every other thing God is doing, the preaching of the gospel and the marriage institution, is to help man to come back and to be conformed to the image of the son. So what God expects of both of you is that two years after marriage, you become more like Christ. You know, you can come to the altar and act as if all is well. Your wife knows if you are fake. You can come to the altar and say, an angel appeared to me, she will say it's a lie. Anytime he wants to deceive people, that's what he says. Everybody can be deceived. They will say, oh God, the man of God. Your wife will just be looking like this. When you want to check whether a man of God is saying the truth, look at the wife. He will stand up and say, God has been helping us. The wife will be like this. I know you. Others may not know you, but me, I know you. So when God wants to put a spiritual alarm system to remind you that you are still a man of flesh, he will introduce you into marriage. Because your wife knows that even if you fasted for seven days, that anger is still there. Your wife is the only person that can tell when that anger leaves. You can fast for seven days and come to church and you will declare, people will fall down, declare. Your wife knows that you are growing in the anointing, but you are not growing in the character of Christ. And the one that will impress your wife will not be the anointing. Watch and see. After you get married, you know, before now when you preach, she will be writing, say, Kai, revelation, revelation. She will not be moved by your revelation again until your character affirms your revelation. Because what she's interested in is you, not what you manifest. And so God will put her around you to check you until you truly become a spiritual man. And the same way God will put her around you, put you around her to check until she becomes a spiritual woman. She can come out and sing and people are shouting under the anointing. You will know, you will say, well, uh, that your song today carry fire, but uh, you are an arrogant person. And that arrogance can stop you from going to God. You will keep at it until she is chiseled. So the idea behind marriage is to bring you to a man who knows your nakedness and a woman who knows your nakedness. You can hide before the whole world. 
not before her because she interacts with you and you interact with her you know i'm in the church now i'm wearing a suit they call me an apostle i'm packaged when i go home my wife will say baby come there there's no suit suit can you don't hide under a suit it's a place where they interact with your being and god knows that if you were not married you can pretend to the whole world so she put somebody around you that knows you to the depth of you so that even when you come to church and you want to lie when you see her face you will remember that if i lie she will the church will know you will now you will now tell god to teach you how to live truthfully she's an insurance policy so the first under the transformation agenda is to keep her to check your excesses and to guide you until you come to a place where you are conformed to the image of christ and then that also goes to let you know why god doesn't allow you to marry the woman you are dreaming of i know you are hoping now that your wife is 100 percent submissive your wife is 100 percent kind your wife is 100 percent helpful your wife is 100 all those things you have they are in your head welcome on ground <laughs> Welcome home. Welcome. I know she's hoping now that, oh, my husband is a gentleman. We have dated for two years. He never shouted on phone. Welcome. You, are, you have left the virtual world. Now you are in the reality. That man you are looking for is in your brain. You will work on this one. The woman you are looking for is in the, is in the spirit realm. You have finished praying. Now that you have fasted, your eyes are open now. Open your eyes and see the person that came. You will walk on this one. That's why God gave Adam a woman that can still listen to the serpent. Because it was the job of the man to cultivate and to guide. He speaks of priesthood, a kind of priesthood that every irresponsibility will tell on you. God doesn't give men finished products. Because he wants men to be part of creation. God doesn't give women finished products. Because he wants them to participate in the agenda of creation. That's why God only created Eden to host heaven. He expected the man to extend Eden to every part of the world. Outside of Eden were dry ground. But the man did not understand what God does. Your wife will be patient to a degree. You will complete it by torturing her. So every time she rebels against you, you will need to develop a wisdom that no other person knows or has towards her. Because the idea is not to respond to her the way she responds to you. So when you notice that there is bitterness in her heart, when you notice that there is anger in her heart, your job now will be to sit down and trust the Holy Spirit to give you a wisdom on how to work on that bitterness, to work on that anger until she becomes a perfect person. So in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26, it says that thou mightest cleanse her by washing with water by the word of God. So everything about her that does not align with what God said, you will use the word of God to shape her until she sustains that posture. So you become her prophet. The same way she will become your prophet. God will not be pleased that you come every day and tell God, this woman you have given me is this. Huh. When you say that, he will still judge you. Because when Adam showed up and said, the woman you gave to me is the one that brought it, you are that story. When you finish talking that story, this is the judgment. Go and suffer. Because it was your responsibility to chisel this woman, to shape this woman until she becomes like Christ. Before now, the responsibility for her spiritual transformation was solely hers. But from today, it is divided. The extent of her growth in the things of the spirit and the extent to which she becomes like Christ is dependent on you. And if you fail, God will ask you for it. That's why I'm telling you, this business does not run on emotion. Now you have taken an assignment and a responsibility. Before now, if you went to heaven, God will ask you about your soul. But now God won't ask only you. If this woman fail, God will ask you. Because he gave you a responsibility to guard and to watch over her. That's what priesthood is about in marriage. If they knew her before to be an angry woman, because of this marriage, you will develop a spiritual pattern to alter that thing until she becomes a sweet person. If they knew her before to be an impatient woman, that means you have a responsibility of nurturing her until she grows and develops patience. If they knew you before to be a an easily provoked person, it will be her responsibility 
to bring you down until everything that is consistent with the nature of Christ comes out of your spirit. So marriage is not a journey of fun. The fun is part of it. Marriage is actually a responsibility of transformation. So today, what will be happening on this altar is that they will give you weapons and chisels. It may be a chisel of patience. It may be a chisel of long suffering. It may be a chisel of kindness. It may be a chisel. Maybe before now, if somebody gives you, you give the person back. You don't have those powers anymore. You may receive a chisel of endurance. So when somebody talks, you will be teaching, thinking of how to help the person instead of firing back because you have lost that ability. Now you have become a carpenter. You will shape something out of this woman until the beauty and the glory of God in her manifest. And she will chisel you until the glory of God that men can't see in you begins to manifest. So the idea of marriage is to help one another until we are conformed to the image of Christ. Number three, the idea of marriage is to give God an opportunity to have a godly heritage transferred from one generation to another generation. Today you are two. Tomorrow you'll be three. Next tomorrow you'll be four. You'll be five. Everything God planned to do on the earth, he does through men. And I can assure you that God is grossly limited because men that God can use are few. So one of the ways God devises to raise his own dynasty on the earth realm is to bring two people together so that what comes out of them will become a vessel and a container that God can host his glory. So every time you give birth, it's actually not your son. It's an errand from heaven to earth that you are just supposed to pretend over. So you become a nurturer of the heritage of God. The reason our society is bad today is not because the church is failing. It's because family is failing. You know, many times people come and they are accusing pastors. They are accusing bishops. They are accusing apostles. That see, our society is in trouble because of churches. They don't know what is happening. Society is not failing because church is failing. Society is failing because family is failing. Because you are supposed to produce a godly heritage to God. When Jesus came, they didn't trace Jesus to the synagogue. They traced Jesus to Abraham and to Adam. Because who a man is, is not traced to the church where he comes from. Who a man is, is traced to the family where he came from. That's why your name is Moses Oga. It is your family that has the primary responsibility to make you a seed of God. The church has only come to support the family, to do what the family is doing. So I came to tell you today that God is looking forward to sending another errand to the earth realm. And you are God's channel. Because there are many things God has in mind that is not yet executed on the earth. And because God is in a hurry to execute something on the earth, that's why I put urgency in your heart. You think it's your love that is driving you. I, I need to get married this year. There's a problem. It's not your... That, thing, that reason you are giving is mundane. The reason you need to get married this year is because maybe in 2022, God wants to raise another prophet. And there is no way he can find that prophet. Because the, the other family he entered, the, 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 the river that flowed there is the video. So before that child came, the vibrations in that child's body is already serpentine. He entered the other family, all they were watching is big brother Niger. So children of two years old, no sex. They know how they can, fornication is normal. He entered the other family, all they are saying are negative words that are, that are filthy in the realm of God. So he's looking for where his spirit can alight. And since he couldn't find any other one, the, the earth is already saturated. The only thing he can do is to go and pull you from Kaduna to Makodi. And then you are going to Makodi, you say, I'm trying to be wise. No, you are not wise. Your steps are ordered. And when you came to Makodi, he cast your gaze upon her because he wants to send an errand to the earth. You know, two months ago, you were everywhere calling, hi, this marriage has to be this year. And then you thought, oh boy, I'm not getting any younger. Hmm, it's not about age, sir. Because you're actually getting younger. <laughs> You are looking, you say, ah, okay, they, they now save our weights now. Why, why not we gather some money? You say money is not anything. We will move by faith. We will move by faith. You think it's big. No, it's beyond all of those things. Your steps were ordered. A spirit was manipulating you. Because there are many graces that will come to the earth in 2022. And God wants your home to be a channel. Because the idea behind marriage is to raise a godly heritage. 
is to raise a godly heritage. So he said to the children of Israel, he said, your children will be holy because I am holy. He said, when you bless Israel, say these words, the Lord keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance above you. The Lord give you peace. And he said, let the name of the Lord be named upon you because you have become God's seed on the face of the earth. You are not just getting married because you love her. You know, sometimes your body is shaking. You want to hold your wife. You, you are saying, Lord, help me, help me. Somebody said the other time, he said sometimes he wants to carry his wife on the head and just run into the bush. <laughs> when you get married, you will discover that even intimacy is a responsibility. <laughs> it's not that a demon is manipulating you. When she wears skirt, you are... You, are, you look at another side. Mama, mama, mama. You are speaking in tongues so that you will not fall. Ha! When you get married, you will discover that those things that were happening, it was a demon. You, you see her knee, you say, Ah, you should have worn lost. You will get married, you will be reading your Bible. She will come out of the bathroom with towel, you won't notice. In fact, you will have to. It will be responsibility for you to, to say you are looking beautiful. And, and you will need that wisdom. If she make her hair to tell her your hair is fine. Because you will not notice. You will now discover that a demon was trying to destroy your destiny. When he was telling you to touch her. You, you are doing as if you want to die. When you marry her. Sometimes for two days. you, you hi, It's responsibility. Intimacy is responsibility. So intimacy has a greater purpose than just for pleasure. It is a gate through which God brings heritage to the earth. And your marriage will be a channel through which princes will rise, prophets will rise, apostles will rise, leaders of tomorrow will rise. Because God will depend on your marriage in order to send another errand to the face of the earth. The third purpose of marriage is to transfer divine heritage from one generation to another your emotion is the last thing on this equation your emotion is not important and you will find out very soon when you get married The last one I will speak about is priesthood. You see that I'm just being spiritual, spiritual. I know when we get married, they will advise you and tell you, love your wife, protect her. When you people want to quarrel, just keep quiet and talk later. Those are good. Though. They are very good. Those advice, they are good. They will tell your wife, cook for your husband, whatever he asks, give him. Don't quarrel with him. When he's angry, just keep quiet. Read it. They are good. But these things, I'm telling you, if God puts it in your spirit, those ones will be natural. If you become conformed to the image of Christ, you won't attack your husband. You won't dishonor your husband. You won't have the ability to do it. It will not just be you trying to obey rules and regulations. You will lose the ability. When you become like Christ, you will not be able to hurt her. You will not be able to offend her. You will feel the compassion of Jesus for her. Because these are spiritual things. And then the final thing is priesthood. Priesthood is the salt of the earth. Every time spirits build civilizations is because of priesthood. The reason people are dressing naked on the street today is priesthood. It's a civilization of a spirit. Society is a portrait of the nature of priesthood that dominates it. The reason people think somebody loves them today by sleeping with a person is the nature of priesthood. The idea is to destroy the morality of our world. The reason people think if you don't take bribe, you can't succeed is priesthood. They have cultured the world to believe that until you cut corner, there is no success. Demonic intelligences take over territories 
when there is a negative priesthood the same way the energy of God will dominate the territory when positive priesthood increases and so when God brings two people together it's so that they can join hands together and raise an altar over a territory to raise an altar over a system prayer is more in view in marriage than emotion that's why God said in first Peter chapter 3 he said when you relate with her relate with her as unto the weaker vessel so that your prayers will be answered that means your relationship with her heightens your priesthood in the spirit so when you buy her a gift it's not just because you want to make her happy when you are offended but you choose to respect her and not attack her it's not just because you are a good man it's partly because you are but again you also realize that it has an impact on your authority in the spirit and so if you want to have a high level of priesthood you will be compared to relate with this woman you know when i wanted to marry my wife i told her something i said hmm, when people are talking in marriage seminars or churches it looks as if they are bombarding the women honor your husband be submissive to your husband be this in this equation the man is the endangered species the bible said something it said if you don't treat her like the weaker vessel your prayer will not be answered and without prayer you don't have a ministry so imagine what god is telling you that if you make this woman unhappy and you are guilty stop praying you are wasting your time go and make peace first so your relationship with her can keep your ministry on hold for one year do you see why many pastors don't go anywhere they are fasting they are doing gathering doing vg and then they are molesting their wives they are intimidating their wives they are not building their wives up a confident woman that married you suddenly becomes a mediocre because you want to prove that you are a man of the house and then you don't know why the more you pray the more your ministry sink that means God is putting the future of your ministry in her hand. Who is at risk? It looks as if the woman is in trouble. You are the stronger vessel. You are actually the weaker vessel in this equation. The Bible said, if you do not provide for your household, it says you have denied the faith. That means you are not in the faith anymore. You are worse than an infidel. You are actually an endangered species. That's why you need help to be able to love a woman. Love is not a feeling. You will need God to help you to, to, to be a husband. You don't come and say, I have two million in my account. So you are joking. God will need to help you to be a husband. And because you realize that you need help to be a husband, it will affect your priesthood. Your intercourse and interaction with God will be heightened and your authority over eternity will become stronger. And the same thing applies to the wife. He said the glory of the woman from now on is not the hairstyle. It's not the foundation and the eyelashes. He said the glory of the woman from now on is the countenance of meekness, honor, humility, lowliness that she demonstrates towards her husband. He said the same way Sarah honored her husband and called him Lord. That's what gives glory to this woman from now on. You know, many women think that uh, their glory is in their intelligence. So they will come and talk, talk, talk. They will pack their hair, do like this. What they are saying is intelligent. But when men look at them, they'll say, look at this proud person. So instead of that intelligence to attract favor, it attracts reproach. So women are so good in what they think they are so good. They won't even let their husband say, hey. The moment they come out with their husband, they take charge of the conversation. Before their husband say anything, they are in charge. They literally dominate their husband. Because they feel that they are powerful, they are smart. It actually attracts reproach to them. Because they don't understand this equation. The beauty of a woman after marriage is in her meekness. It's in her submission. And that's why when God was defining love from his own realm, he didn't call your love for her a feeling. He calls your love for her sacrifice. So from today, the only way God will know you love her is as you are willing to die for her. The same way Christ died for the church. And the only way God will see that she loves you is her desire to submit and to follow you all the days of her life. Because this equation is to provoke priesthood. If she doesn't submit to you, she will have no priesthood in the spirit. If you don't, if you don't take care of her, you have no priesthood in the spirit. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 
Paul began to teach us. He said the head of every man is Christ. And the head of Christ is God. And he said the head of the woman is the man. He said a woman cannot prophesy with her head uncovered because of the angels. What he was talking about is the rebellion of Lucifer. You have no priesthood before God except as you are completely under the authority of your husband. That is what will give you right to participate in the realm of God. And remember, our journey on earth does not end on earth. End on earth. We are going somewhere. And if you are mindful of eternity, you will make your priesthood count. And the way your priesthood count from today, it's not just that you pray in tongues for 10 hours. It's that you are under your husband's authority. His covering is all over you. And it is evident that his authority superintends over everything you do. He said, when you do that, you have a priesthood before God. And concerning the husband, he said, when you can take care of your wife in total and absolute reality, the way Jesus took care of the church and is willing to die for the church, he said, then you will have authority in the realm of God. So marriage actually revealed to us the true essence of priesthood. That priesthood is not just prayer. Priesthood is sacrifice and priesthood is submission. And that's why when you read the whole Bible, only priests offer sacrifice. And so every time you sacrifice to this woman is a testimony of your heart posture and the kind of priesthood that you have before God. Every time she submits to you is a testimony of her priesthood before God. And can I assure you, the hardest thing for a man to do is to sacrifice. And the hardest thing for a woman to do is to submit. A woman always wants to express herself, but submission say keep quiet. That keep quiet is the hardest thing for her. But if you understand that you are not just keeping quiet because your wife, husband is honorable. You are not just keeping quiet because you are, you are being oppressed. But because of God, you will always keep quiet. Because the day may come as life is funny. That you may assume that you have known everything about your husband. Anything he talks, you say forget. Huh. That is the day of your risk. When you give birth to three children... Nothing will scare you anymore. You are rooted in the family. You can jack your husband if you want and say, what do you want? Even his family members can't do anything. That time you have become the mama of the house. But that is the time when, that time when you think you are already established, that is when you become most vulnerable. Because if you don't consciously submit to him, to be humble, to be quiet, to follow, you will lose your stand with God. And that time that you think you have seen everything about your wife, you see, then she was slim. She was glorious to look upon. Why, why are you adding flesh like this? And then you, she, she said, come. You say, please, later. Leave, leave. Huh, you are in trouble. That is when love will now become a responsibility. Because you, even if you don't feel like you will hug her, even if you don't feel like if you are coming home, you will buy a gift. Anything she needs, you will go out of your way to provide it. Because it is not just care. It is priesthood. So it will sentence you to a life of sacrifice. And you will notice that the more you do that sacrifice, the more it will become natural for you to walk with God. It will become easier for you to grow with God. Your walk with God will become so fluid and you wonder how. Because John told us something. He said, if you cannot love your brother that you see, how can you claim that you love God that you do not see? And Jesus said, whatsoever you do to the least of your brother, you do to me so when you master and you committedly begin to take care of this woman you will discover that your work with God will become stronger your power in the spirit will become stronger and your priesthood will become stronger you will come to a crusade ground and you will just declare things will happen you'll be shocked and I know this by experience two months after I got married I walk into a meeting and I'll just start I know what is happening with people I can tell you there's somebody on this second row there is a growth on your breast. I didn't have those dimensions before. I can walk into a meeting, and it's not one meeting, every meeting. I am ministering this afternoon by three o'clock somewhere. It will happen. Not because I saw an angel in the spirit, I just got married, and I began to enter into dimensions. I'll come for a meeting, I'll say, ah, there's somebody on the first row here, you have an issue with your left ear. Somebody will stand up. I was in a bad one last week. I just took time. Over three ministers preached before I preached. And when I came up, I was so tired. When I was, when I was done teaching, I just took. And I began to see. I said, there's a fair young man on the third row. One of your legs is short. I just grew out. I didn't need to go and fast for 40 days to build faith. The guy rushed out. I said, wait, don't be excited. 
confirm it. Leg grew out just by word of knowledge. I looked by the right. I said, there's somebody you have a gastric challenge. It has gone. It just left. There's a lady here. There is growth on your breast. Check. That growth has gone. As I'm seeing, I'm just talking. And as I'm talking, it's happening. I didn't know how I entered. I didn't have any encounter. I just got married. And the dimension shifts. The authority shifted. If I stand up, I was in a meeting with him in Benin. I was so tired, I flew in from Ghana. And I just went for the meeting. And when I was done sharing, I just stood up. I said, if you have growth on your body, just stand. And they stood up. I said, the growth is gone. And more than five ladies ran out crying. Growth had dematerialized. Just because I got married and I began to follow these things. And God just kept shifting. God just kept shifting. God just kept shifting. Doors opening everywhere. In the midst of warfare, we are just gliding. And we don't notice anything is happening. There is so much in marriage that if a man will pay the price to harness it, he will see the glory of God like never before. I charge you this day, fight to keep the unity and the oneness that this covenant places upon your life. I charge you, don't have any reason to look back and don't let anything divide you. Insist on keeping that unity. And while you are keeping it, realize that every challenge you have does not come to destroy you. It rather came to transform you. Because the goal of this union is for you to become more like Jesus Christ. I know you are a preacher, but there, is, there are certain things in you that nobody knows. Your wife came to discover them. You may not know that you are impatient because nobody has worked with you closely. Your wife will come to reveal to you that you are impatient. And every time she takes an action that shows you are impatient, it's not a time to attack her. It's a time to ask God to help you. I never knew there was impatience in me. Your wife will come to let you know that there was anger in your spirit that you didn't know about. So her coming to you and the challenges that may come will not be to destroy you. It will be to make you a better person. And the same thing applies to you, my dear sister. You may not know that you are impatient. You may not know that you talk too much. You may not know that you are an aggressive person. It is your husband that will show you. And when he shows you, instead of fighting and saying, this thing will not work anymore, look inward. Before you call the marriage the problem, find out the things that you have that needs to be touched. Because Jesus wants you to become like him. And the marriage is a platform for achieving that. Also remember that as you got married today, you become a portal through which God will bring a heritage to the earth. So it's not just about what you want or what you like. I can assure you that every married man and woman that divorced when life is not threatened or when there is no case of infidelity was selfish because they never thought about their children. Most of the problems in society today are created by children that were raised by half parents. You have no right to walk out on this union except like the Bible said in the case of infidelity. You have no right and I tell you if you have known Jesus well nothing can even make you break up and if you know that your children you owe them that responsibility you will be a covering to them until they also grow into their destiny it is selfishness for a family to break up it is selfishness for a man and woman to divorce when they have a child they don't know their responsibility to those children and because they don't know that marriage came to provide godly heritage they just thought it was about them and because they are offended, because they can't take it anymore, they go. How about the children? Your children will be mighty because you will pay the price to raise them. And finally, like I have said, you must realize that it's a priesthood. Everything you see that you don't like is a call to prayer. And everything that you do is not primarily because of her. It's because of Jesus. Everything she does is not primarily because of you. There are many times you will forgive her, not because she's reasonable you will because of Jesus. There are many times you will forgive you, not because you are reasonable, but because of Jesus. So everything you do going forward on the strength of priesthood, know that it is first of all because of Jesus before it is because of her. I know that now that love is bubbling in your soul, you will say, I love you, I will do anything for you. When you get married for three years, you will drop that language. So I give you something that is eternal. Because of Jesus, keep moving forward. And the Lord will hallow this relationship just bow your heads and talk to the Lord some of us in this place 
it's possible that our marriage or marriages may have crises or challenges this is another opportunity for you to talk to the Lord concerning your marriage because every time God sends his words to Jacob he also sends it to Israel because there is a portal where God is sanctifying and blessing a union there can be an extension to you and then you can ask the Lord you can ask the Lord to touch your home and you can also ask the Lord to touch you you have always compared and complained about everybody betraying you or offending you have you checked yourself for once it's an opportunity for you to do a retrospective check because the problem may just be you your wife may not just be an angry woman maybe it's because you don't know how to talk your husband may not be an impatient man maybe it's just because you are too proud can you check and ask the Lord to help you this morning remember it's about oneness it's about transformation it's about priesthood and it's about the heritage tell the Lord to help you this morning and you are trusting God to get married it's also an opportunity for you to trust the Lord to breathe upon you and to bring you favor to step in we don't marry because we are good looking we don't marry because we are mature we marry because we are favored it takes favor for a man or a woman to want to join his or herself to you for a lifetime you want to ask the Lord this morning to grant you that favor in the name of Jesus Christ in the name of Jesus Christ maybe you are here this morning and um, your walk with the Lord is threatened it may have been caused by your home may have been caused by where you live or maybe you've never had the opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life you can just place your hand on your chest the Bible said today is the day of salvation the world we live in is is a treacherous world you cannot leave it for tomorrow you want to tell the Lord become the Lord of my life or you want to rededicate yourself to Jesus this morning while he's beautifying their life let there be an extension to you as well so that your own life too will be beautified is there anybody here that wants to make that pledge you are rededicating yourself to Jesus or you are receiving Jesus for the first time as the Lord of your life okay you may just wish to wave so I know if there is anybody like that and then lead us in that prayer quickly is there anybody like that oh glory to the Lord Jesus Christ